I really can't think of, of better people to start us off than today's two speakers. Let me briefly introduce them before I outline the structure of our program. John Barry is a native of New Jersey, which as I said earlier, explains a few things about him. <laughs> and he's, he is a graduate of Boston University and Simmons College Graduate Library School. He became editor and chief of Library Journal, a flagship um, journal and magazine in our field in 1969 after serving as assistant editor for four years. He, in so doing, he wrote more than 700 editorials, feature articles, and conference reports in Library Journal and other journals and books. Let me give that to you again. 700 <laughs> editorials, articles, books, journals, chapters, etc. That's a lot. Active in the American Library Association, Barry has participated at the highest levels in some of the most important and controversial issues faced by the library and information science professions, along with launching two new publications in the field. He is the recipient of numerous awards, has taught in a number of graduate library and information science programs, and upon retirement, in 2006, he remains editor at large for Library Journal and writes a column. He is truly a distinguished member of my profession and we're honored to have him here. He will speak on the historic forces that have caused Americans to both fear and welcome in immigrants, developing at the same time a deep distrust of and an utter dependence on easy access to information and the role of government in information provision. Dr. Christy Ankin, our own, is an associate professor of education administration here at Seton Hall. Chris holds a bachelor's from Kutztown University, an MA from Rutgers, about which I've spoken to him already, about the error of his ways, <laughs> and an EDD from Seton Hall. His scholarship has consistently taken on the mythologies and misinformation that drives school reform. For instance, in his 2011 book, How I Got to Know Him, The School Reform Landscape, Fraud, Myth, and Lies, and his Kappa Delta Pi record article, Common Core Standards, The Emperor Has No Clothes or Evidence. I think it sums up a lot of his scholarship right there in the titles. Both are among his most cited works. He was named 2014 College of Education and Human Services Researcher of the Year and won the Truman Kelly Award for Outstanding Scholarship in 2013, among other honors. That last one was from Kappa Delta Pi. Chris will speak today from his most recent book, Defying Standardization, Creating Curriculum for an Uncertain Future, which pushes back at the misinformation surrounding the push to standardize the curriculum and expectations for 56 million public school children in the US. It might seem a little bit like this takes the theme of misinformation and fake news and pushes it far afield. But this, I would argue, is sort of where we start. I read an article recently um, on the Ber Silvio Berlusconi phenomenon in Italy, um, who was more or less a precursor to Trump. And the author of that article said, as professionals, as information professionals, in which he sweeps in journalists and educators, he basically said, we can't do much about this phenomenon. Um, the speaker series is part of our small effort here to push back at that kind of assertion that um, there is some meaning in knowing something, there is some meaning in grounded and war warranted uh, uh, assertions and fact. So that will be the order of our speakers. Mr. Barry first, Professor Tink and second. They'll each speak for about 20 minutes, leaving us some time for a Q&A session at the end. So with that, I again welcome you and invite our first speaker, John Barry to the podium. Thank you, John. I am a librarian, too. <laughs> and the history and core values and mission of libraries emerged from the chaos 
of revolution and development of democratic self-government. The seeds of that chaos, of course, were sowed with the tea and we dumped into Boston Harbor. Our roots in revolution, born again two or three times in uh, each generation, make us very suspicious and distrustful of government, with a very special dislike of taxation, of course. Yet despite those roots and distrust of government, our uh, need to know made us organize form associations to be better informed. That impulse grew and later, despite our reluctance to allow government to grow, we turned to government <coughs> to meet our need for the information to govern ourselves. Those chaotic origins also triggered our fears and hopes about immigrants and immigration. They too have always been a part of American society and politics. And they've been manifest in dozens of ways, some respect, receptive and welcoming, and some fearful and rejecting, as recent uh, politics illustrates so well. On the positive side, the arrival of waves of immigrants coupled with the obvious coming of the abolition of slavery triggered measures to speed what we, what we used to call the uh, assimilation of these new citizens into American society and into the workings of our economy, education system, and democracy. These efforts continue today in American cities as new refugees and immigrants arrive from dozens of troubled parts of the world. Then and now arrayed, uh, arrayed against immigrants are a host of obstacles, prejudices, hostile forces, and alas, governments. But despite them, enlightened leaders regularly came up with ways to reform and to educate immigrants, to help them become integrated and into our society and culture. My favorite, of course, was the uh, one proposed in Boston in 1852. That was back when William Lloyd Garrison was still publishing The Liberator opposition to slavery was growing. The Irish were escaping to America from famine. And the nation was moving, alas, towards civil war. It was less than a decade before several southern states seceded from the Union. Facing all this upheaval and wrenching change, leaders proposed building, the, of all things, the Boston Public Library as a way to educate and indoctrinate the waves of new and old American citizens into democ democratic self-government. The proposal coupled information and education with immigration and the end of slavery. That case residence resonates even more urgently in today's America. Here's a little, and my favorite part actually, the small part of what they said. For it has been rightly judged that under political, social, and religious institutions like ours, it is of paramount importance that the means of general information should be so diffused that the largest possible number of persons should be induced to read and understand questions going down to the very foundations of social order. Questions which are constantly presenting themselves and which we as a people are constantly required to decide and do decide either ignorantly or wisely.
In effect, the Boston trustees told the city, we need a, people, a public library to make certain these decisions are made wisely. With all the information and erudition we can offer. It is too obvious that such measures are urgently needed today as we face new hordes of refugees, new racism, new threats to inform democratic self-government. I won't detail the problems here. I mean, all you need to do is watch Facebook or Twitter or the TV news or read any good newspaper and you hear both our hopes and fears about immigration and information. In Boston, that new information need became apparent because of a horde of new immigrants, a new system of public schools, and the mostly private universities and colleges demonstrated that need for a place to keep learning, to teach new members of the society, children and adults, immigrants and natives, some place where an individual could search as much or as little, in as much or as little depth as he or she wanted or needed. It would be a place to meet with others to discuss and get help with the search, to read and talk together with other humans. It was, after all, John Harvard's library around which that great university was built much earlier in the same locale. But now we face profound change in information and the library world. Technology alters how information is created, retrieved, managed, and shared. <clears throat> it has raised new questions about the need for and function of libraries and all other information providers. As I'm sure you have heard too often, there is that major metamorphosis, metamorphosis in the role that libraries of all types play, the way libraries are perceived, and the way information is disseminated, managed, and paid for, and has brought great uncertainty for libraries and library organizations. As a matter of fact, all information workers. We all agree for sure that libraries continue to play an important role in connecting people with quality information, but the library is being increasingly disintermediated from this process, or so they tell us. Perceptions of the value of libraries seem to be waning, both with traditional users and the special constituencies, whether they are students in schools and colleges, workers in business, in faculty or faculty and researchers in universities and laboratories. In my opinion, much of this is simply what uh, Galbraith called conventional wisdom, that already cliched notion that all one needs to be informed is a connection to the internet. This perception is a huge challenge to libraries and all information sources of every type, especially those funded by public taxes, always under pressure in this society, and more so now in a weak economy with a government in the hands of politicians who I guess see the Twitter tweet as the best way to disseminate information. We are left with a tremendous challenge to offer new value-added and technologically sophisticated services to meet new needs of citizens, and many of those needs have not yet been discovered or defined. There is an added challenge in information now, however. Too many of us, especially if we are 35 or older, including, alas, many experienced librarians and educators, know a lot less about the new information arena than uh, you in this room probably do. So in addition to having to define new roles for ourselves and the institutions, 
we face having to find a new, uh, find a way to help those entrenched, experienced librarians and educators understand that new arena. Some of them will not welcome that help. And it will be a test of our political and diplomatic skills to win them over. Some, of course, will welcome help with the new information sources and issues and new insights. But there are strong warnings and signals that suggest no challenging and difficult rules for all information professionals like us, really the only professionals after all, with a mandate and mission to be sure everyone is informed. Commercial internet-based firms and agencies provide much of what librarians once did in this society, where we still worship free enterprise and free markets of capitalism. We are told that this model, which puts information and the services to provide it in that marketplace and not in government, is a better model. We really have to work to strengthen and sharpen our own political and economic skills to convince the society that the role of taxation and thus of government in this information equation, equation is absolutely crucial. Indeed, may be the salvation of democratic self-government. What we already know is that in the free, unregulated marketplace of information, it is far more susceptible to corruption, distortion, prejudice, and downright falsification than it has been in uh, tax-supported libraries, whether they are public or part of public education. We learned after decades of decades of information inundation from these commercial sources that we must be more suspicious of them than we are of government. sources, the ones we have always mistrusted. As children, after all, we learned to disregard most advertising claims. Now we are learning that even medical research is being corrupted by those who manufacture pharmaceuticals, that nutrition information is falsified and corrupted by commercial food processing interests. Where yet, we watch and listen to media already suspect themselves because of their need to sell advertising to survive. And now they're being bought and owned by those with private agendas that may or may not be in the public interest. I mean, is there anyone who hasn't wondered about the media owned by Rupert Murdoch? Uh, does anyone expect a politician like that uh, former mayor of Toronto crack smoking guy who tried to cut the library budget, or the Koch brothers, remember them, <laughs> who actually financed robocalls to uh, kill a budget referendum uh, at the uh, Plainfield, Illinois library. It's difficult to understand how anyone on the user side in this debate over health care and our new law could not understand the problem of misinformation. In fact, several public libraries in Tea Party states have been attacked by politicians for trying to provide information to help people take advantage of Obamacare. On a more subtle level, we have watched how commercial publishing interests have tried to convert the dissemination of scholarly research results into profitable ventures for themselves, regardless of the obstacles they have placed in the way of easy and fast use of research. Much of that research, incidentally, supported by government grants. These sources of the corruption of our information and its flow have become so sophisticated and powerful that their ability to influence legislation, government at all levels, and even international relations 
has led our nation into huge errors, bad laws, and even changed our nation's policies toward, thanks, toward other nations. In short, what we have learned over the decades, alas, to be as suspicious of the commercial and marketplace sources of our information as we are of our government. Unless you see me as some kind of conspiracy theorist or not, be assured, I believe that corruption has always been a part of our society and its institutions, both public and private. So what is the job of a librarian and educator and the school and library to become in all of this? First, it means that educators and librarians will not disappear, and it proves that we are now needed in ways not yet defined or discovered. In ways and with an aggressive, proactive stance that is contrary to our traditional stance and our culture. Despite that inspired mandate from Boston in 1852, libraries never really delivered fully on the, uh, on the promise. Questions of funding will always remain urgent, and a new generation of aggressive political advocacy will be needed to secure the resources we'll need. We'll have to work together to specify how our new roles as the validators, correctors, eliminators of corrupted information and its sources will be executed. It's not an entirely new role for we librarians. It is we who developed over decades the criteria by which to evaluate an information source, like the reference book. In the early days, we said that information ages even becomes obsolete. We said, therefore, that currency, along with authority and the expertise of the compilers, the reputation of the publisher or purveyor, the comprehensiveness of the source were all to be checks of its validity. It's obvious that we still now have roles in determining not only the validity of information sources, the, of the techniques of searching for and finding those sources, but also in teaching everyone in our society both the criteria for and the techniques needed to evaluate information. Like brains are beginning, and educators are beginning to reinvent themselves and their institutions to, re to reframe their missions. They are learning to measure or assess and publicize their value to constituents. Still, public libraries will remain crucial, basic gateways for large numbers of immigrants and lower income individuals and families. They will offer the only point of access to the digital world for millions, an extremely important position. They will meet a broad spectrum of needs for all ages and people of differing groups and demographic backgrounds. That will mean more aggressive job search services, helping children learn to read and navigate the internet serving as safe havens for teenagers, providing social and community gathering places for seniors to learn the same stuff. In Queens, the library provides English as a second language classes, and along with it, internet training with special lessons on how to navigate the government services of the city, especially as Board of Education to its hundreds of immigrant neighborhoods. Same thing's going on at the Bronx branch of the New York Public Library. Public library is more vital now than when Carnegie invested so much in them a century ago. Their physical presence, highly important. Yet resource constraints prevent being more open when they get the most heavy use which would come in evenings and weekends. Funding for school libraries 
is more uncertain now despite the growing need for them as sources of information proliferate and more complex skills are required to navigate among these sources. There's an urgent need to educate younger children on how to apply technology to a wide variety of information-related questions. As school library services are reduced, municipal and state leaders may call on their public libraries to partner with the schools in providing academic libraries have already become places where faculty get counseling on their own intellectual property rights in their research and their rights to the fair use of the work of others to do their teaching and research as well as access to all the newest tools and resources for that research. The survival of libraries is threatened only if they lack the resources to keep pace with the ever advancing technology, are unable to provide relevant services to users, lack the distinguishing characteristics that are the measure of value that will ensure that their services and resources are valued, utilized, and supported. So even as the digital divide decreases, and access to digital technologies becomes more widespread, significant gaps will remain between those who possess the means and skills to navigate cyberspace and evaluate the quality of the information obtained. Libraries may no longer be a place to every, the uh, portal to everything or the primary go-to go -to source for information as we have perceived the traditional library and librarian role. Although, in fact, we have rarely fully delivered on that role. Now our job as retrievers is replaced by demand for alternative approaches to accessing information, resources, and knowledge. We information professionals must create clear metrics to measure the use and evaluate the effectiveness of our institutions with users, broadcast the results of that to users and funders. The role of information professionals will change radically. The best professionals are already part of the struggle of that struggle, and we will welcome every citizen to join us in the challenges ahead, making sure our society is informed and not misinformed by those who corruptly seek an information advantage. I believe that essential information services will continue to be provided by government through taxation and as they carve in the stone over the entrance to that Boston Public Library. It will be free to all. Thanks. When I study curriculum and assessment issues at the state, national, and international level. My discussion today, I'd like to push back a little bit on the rhetoric you hear about failing public schools. So I'd like to provide you just a quick overview of maybe the history of some of that rhetoric, give you some data that contradicts that rhetoric, and hopefully just pique your interest in terms of digging below the headlines that you might see uh, in print, online, and on the news about this idea that American public schools are in fact failing. So. Now we hear a lot about this idea of fake news, but public educators have been dealing with fake news for quite some time. Actually, John Dewey spoke about it in the 1890s. Horace Mann uh, dealt with it in the, in the 1850s. So for educators, fake news is nothing new to us. The most common piece of fake news that you probably hear is that this idea that US public school students lag behind their international peers 
in terms of academic achievement. It's so common now that people go on the news and they just say it and no one even questions it anymore. It's just a, a known fact that American public schools are failing, or at least it's, that's what we are told. So uh, every two or three years, there's a round of international tests that are given. The latest round was called the PISA, the Program International Student Assessment. Uh, and here's a headline from one of those. And the article goes on to complain about the fact that US students are ranking in dismal positions in relation to the world. And that somehow is going to impact society and global competitiveness. So the genesis for the rhetoric that you hear now, the post-World War II genesis of this rhetoric, really came, comes from Sputnik, 1957, when the Russians launched the first satellite into space. At that point, there was a national hysteria that the education system was in fact failing. And every president since Eisenhower has referred to Sputnik in some way to drive an education agenda. One of the things that interests me was, especially when I was writing my first book about this topic, was, well, was Sputnik really a defeat for US education? And so my co-author and I went into the declassified memos from the Eisenhower Foundation at the Eisenhower Library. And all the memos from all of those meetings about Sputnik are there for public review. And we actually found the opposite to be true. Based on the presidential memos, Eisenhower was actually not upset that the Russians launched a satellite. He was actually pleased because he wanted to avoid World War III over this idea of opening up space. So he saw this, uh, the launch as something that was good. And he knew, because he was told by our scientists, that we could have launched a satellite 12 to 18 months prior to the Soviets, but we chose not to do so for political and reasons of world peace. And here's an example of some of the memos that you could find uh, if you look. This is this makes you think sometimes that the US Department of Education doesn't pay its internet bill, because things like this are widely available for the bureaucrats who make policy, yet they continue to use verbiage about this, this Sputnik moment in terms of uh, public education failing. But even though Eisenhower had this information, he chose to make a different speech about Sputnik. Uh, and he said that the US was scientifically behind the Soviets, education needed to be improved, and to do this, you should pass my bill, the National Defense Education Act, which was aimed at funneling more money into K-12 basic education science, foreign language, and counseling programs, but first and foremost, to get more money into the research universities. Now you have to remember, uh, back at that time, the idea of federal intrusion into public education, no one would vote for that. So you needed some type of a, a national defense crisis to get federal monies to intervene in public education. And so that's what Eisenhower did. It wasn't out of malice towards the public schools. It was a political tool. This idea of, of failing schools was a political tool to get at what he thought would be a good end in terms of more funding for more programs for more students and, and the higher ed. Uh, what that brought about were covers like this on Life Magazine where you have the Soviet student here, high school student on the left, the American high school student on the right. The Soviet student was described as uh, while he was walking to school, he was doing calculus in his head. He had three science classes, uh, spent all of his time studying and our student here, Stephen, the, 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 the ultimate line in that article was, Stephen spent his time chasing girls. So I had the idea, I wonder what they became in life. So uh, Alexei ended up working for the Soviet FAA. He could not become a pilot, whereas Stephen became a US Navy uh, fighter pilot and, and after that, a, an airline pilot. So I think there's an underlying moral to that story. Uh, sometimes my students tell me, yeah, it's chase girls, right? Oh, that's, that's for you to determine. <laughs> but uh, see, this was another issue of, of, of fake news about failing education. It just doesn't hold up to scrutiny. So the Sputnik moment, this, this crisis continues because you, we are given graphs that look 
like this. And now, if you don't dig below the surface, if you don't try to uncover the misinformation, this looks somewhat troubling. All of this crisis mentality has led to multiple policies, multiple programs at the federal and state levels that have aimed to standardize U.S. education, have brought theories uh, like the theory of performativity, the cult of specificity into public education that has worked to narrow the curricula and the thinking that goes on, not expand it. And it's also brought about this idea of destabilizing public education. Uh, you see things now where you have the idea of, of qualifications are no longer necessary. It's more about quality and quality is measured as output from one test. You have public funds being diverted to private entities through vouchers, charter schools, private schools, uh, corporations that are now training teachers and, and education leaders. A, a great movement of uh, public capital into private coffers. We've moved from an input guarantee funding scheme that was initially developed to level the playing field for all children to make sure that students, if they came from rural or poor backgrounds, their schools were as well equipped as those uh, in, in more wealthy areas. And now we're into this, this philosophy of, of performance guarantee funding. So you are rewarded based on output, most commonly through its standardized test score. The problem with that is that standardized test scores can be predicted based on demographic information knowing nothing about schools. So we're rewarding performance based on things that schools have very little control of. So there's a three-part argument that is used to, to further this, this fake news. America's children are lagging behind based on international test scores. And that's important because it is claimed that these test scores relate to economic output and economic security. And that the way to overcome this lag and, and, and overcome this insecurity is to standardize and destabilize, marketize public education. So for me, one of the things that I do and colleagues do in our research is we kind of test these arguments. So we look at argument one, students lagging behind, is, 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 is really only important if international tests predict economic success. If they do, then that argument may hold some water. And then the third piece is, do these marketized, privatized, standardized solutions actually provide results? The whole underpinning philosophy here is a philosophy of essentialism. It's to prepare kids for the world the way it is. That's a very static mindset if you think about that. Okay. Whereas another philosophy, experimentalism or progressivism, aims to prepare students for the way the world might be. Different mindset there, where knowledge is static in essentialism, and it is evolving and really alive in progressivism. So the current philosophy that underpins all of this is essentialism. You see some of the main concepts behind essentialism. John Dewey talked about this idea of philosophy, and, and more or less, you know, if philosophy doesn't have something to, to back it up, then it is purely speculative. And I'm not sure we should be making policy for 56 million children based on speculation, when evidence exists to, to support other types of policies. So some of the things we, I look at and we look at, do these relationships exist? Are the relationships between standardized test scores at the international level and economic indicators? And the answer is no, not for the strongest economies in the world and certainly not for the G20, the 19 largest economies on the planet. We look at all the different standardized test scores from all the different years because all of these people make up the economy and the economic output that we have. Here is a list of specific economic indicators and there's more that we look at and time and time again, we don't find relationships for the strongest economies of the G20. The weakest economies, of course, there's relationships here because their educational attainment is much lower than ours. We're more highly sophisticated in our educational attainment. But for us, there's no cause and effect between these tests and economic indicators. There's other things that are driving it. The opposite is actually true for the, for, the, for the strongest economies. Education needs the economy as much as the economy needs education. And that is because on these and all standardized tests, the scores are highly related to childhood poverty. Because childhood poverty also predicts site vocabulary, orally learning experiences, collateral learning experiences. It can be the difference, it can sometimes be the difference between kids who come to kindergarten reading and kids who do not. These tests are highly contaminated by poverty factors. And so here's another graph that you don't see. 
These are the poverty indicators for the industrialized world. Now, depending on how you look at this, we are one of the leaders <laughs> or not. You can model how test results would be in a less poor America, and that's, and that's exactly what we do. So in, in our current America, with 23% childhood poverty, we rank 29th on math and things like that. When you model international test scores based on less poor America, let's say 10% poverty, our international test scores are at the top of the world, ahead of all these other countries that routinely outscore us and have poverty levels under 10%. Finland, 3.6%. We outscore Finland. So what about skills and dispositions that you need in an innovation economy? Those skills are not measured by these standardized tests, but there are international indices. So you have these global uh, innovation, global entrepreneurship, global creativity, Nobel Prizes, innovation patents. When you look at downstream indicators of a vibrant education system, you see a different picture. Many of those indicators are taken, the, the, the information is taken from people who are 25 to 50, 45 years old, those are the same people that scored near the bottom of international tests back in the 90s and early 2000s. So there's an incongruence between what these tests are telling us and what international indices of outputs in terms of creativity are telling us. Um, this one here, 60% of Nobel Prize winners since 2003 came from US public schools. I was very interested in seeing that. So here's some indicators that you don't hear about. In fact, you probably hear the opposite of this. We're in the top 10 of all of these. High school graduation, high school completion. High school graduation, the US has one of the strictest definitions. Four years, you have four years. Even though federal law gives special education students with special needs up until age 21, your graduation rate is determined here by four years in, four years out, whereas the rest of the world could be different. We're still in the top 10. Completion, BA degrees, MA degrees, doctorates, we lead the world percent of engineering doctorates, we lead the world. 92% of those are US born. Percent of overall tertiary attainment, so certificate programs, associate degrees, bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, research doctorates, we lead the world. And overall achievement and attainment of our students in poverty is above and beyond what others in the industrialized world produce. And that's according to international data. So policies that standardize and deregulate based on the claims uh, of a failing US, uh, failing US education just can't be justified when you look at the data. And that's why it's important for us in terms of dealing with misinformation to dig below the headline and start asking more questions about what these headlines really mean. And Dewey suggested a way to do that. Uh, it's all about reflective thinking and critique. So I think those of us in the academy, and I see students here, uh, thank you very much for attending. Students, it's important for us, in, I think, in the academy to continue to develop these reflective uh, skills and, and these skills of critique so that we can all be better informed in terms of being able to be more participative in, uh, in a democratic society and really now this global community. And I know, I know Jim mentioned this idea of the library as, as, a, as a very important tool to indoctrinate people into uh, the, the ways of American society. And I would go, I'd go one step forward further, and I would say that the American public school is the incubator of democracy because it is the only institution where all children who are the future leaders must go through. So the more that we chop that up and privatize it and outsource it and silo it, I think you're, you're, beginning to, you're beginning to tread on the underpinnings of democratic society when you destroy a public education system. So I want to thank you very much for coming today. I appreciate your uh, participation. Thank you. You, you both hit upon the, the sort of main theme, and I think both of you have said that, you know, like the poor, misinformation or fake news has always been with us. Um, what do you think the difference is now? Why do you think this has an urgency now? 
don't rush up to the podium to answer. Okay. <laughs> Well, I think the biggest difference now is the fact that we are inundated with new sources of information. It is coming at us from every direction, through every medium known to man. And not only that, the forces that want to use uh, the dissemination of information to gain some sort of inner uh, some sort of advantage in its dissemination are richer, more powerful, and stronger than they have ever been in our past. Uh, what has happened is, of course, that those in power have discovered how easy it is to create and disseminate misinformation and how easy it is to manipulate it to gain a commercial, ideological, or other advantage. That's, that's my view. Yes. I guess I would follow up by saying there's, I think there's also now, compared to 40 years ago, there are specific news outlets for, for specific points of view. And so, you know, naturally people like to hear their point of view be reinforced. And so now you can do that. You can actually live within an echo chamber and never, ever come out. That's true. And, and, and I would just suggest that, uh, especially us in this room, I think we have a bigger responsibility to come out of whatever echo chambers we live in, uh, just to at least be aware of the other things that are being said and once in a while follow up on some of those things. Can the things that we're being told be uh, verified by independent sources. Other questions, John? Uh, just geared towards Chris. Um, based on what you had said in Eisenhower, Sputnik, and having uh, very poor areas, um, we pump money into programs. Is there any thought or postulation that that is wanted to keep those poor? neighborhoods go for a purpose to keep money flowing in so do you mean is, do we want the money not to flow or do we want the money to flow do we in some way want urban areas still to trail is there a benefit to something even okay. if we're on the, the level of being the, 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 the poor um, it shows that American students are failing in mathematics or, or in sciences is there, is there anything behind that wheel that wants to perpetuate that Okay, sure. Uh, and in, in the current environment, yes, there is. There is now an education reform industry. And so you don't need solutions if there's not really problems. So you can see that I think the growth in the education fake news really uh, correlates to the growth in the, in the education reform industry. Uh, it, 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 if you look at the increases in the money being pumped into privatization and, and corporate education reform, you will all see, also see a similar focus on bad education news. So there's money to be made. $787 billion is locked up in public funds in terms of public education. And that is now being unlocked to private sources. The poli And I could just say that some of the policies right down the school district, right down the street, the policies that are being put into place and, and, and those students being subjected to by the state of New Jersey, those policies do not have evidence of effectiveness. So if we know the policies don't work, we continue to do it, and then we continue to see that school district under state control spend millions of dollars of private corporations and private solutions. Uh, you know, I think there's evidence to say that there's money to be made in failing schools. Mm -hmm. um, I'm here. Uh, my colleague Ann and I actually got our Ed Media degrees from Seton Hall. And I also got an educational um, leadership degree um, for a supervisor uh, certificate. And one of the things I think that frustrates, and I'm speaking for you, Anne, sorry about that, that frustrates us so much is as librarians, we see the value that we bring to um, a school, to the students. And yet in ed leadership programs, libraries are never mentioned 
Oftentimes, most supervisors have no idea what goes on, what should go on in a library. And I, I, I feel like here at Seton Hall, we have this, this um, program to train school librarians, Rutgers does as well, but yet there doesn't seem to be any cross-fertilization. And I feel what, every time I hear about a school district eliminating all the librarians, it just crushes me because it, if at any time librarians were more needed, it's now. Um, we just, it's not something that most classroom teachers emphasize and have the time to emphasize. So is there any way to get, you know, those two um, purposes like in, in one um, to have uh, school supervisors and leaders more aware of what the value of school librarians could be and are? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. We, we were actually dialoguing about that exact thing uh, before we came out. And, we, and I, was, I was saying that the, the role of the librarian and media specialist now in public schools, due to standardization mm -hmm. and assessment, has really, the library has become another computer lab mm -hmm. where you do test prep and you give tests. Um, so the, the policy push is pushing the librarian out of the school and as you as you rightly suggest librarians are being replaced with computers so they're taking a librarian they're dismissing you know they're dismissing the librarian and they're buying 50 computers instead so yeah that that is a that is a real issue in terms of the the uh, bringing those ideas into the education leadership program i would say to you yes i mean we can do that um you know it depends on what course you you're taking or uh, you know a lot of that some of that also fills into the curriculum courses that I teach mm -hmm. uh, and so we cover that but for a supervisor certificate you may not have run into that but I think that's a good point because a lot of people go for supervisor certificate mm -hmm. and they do not continue on right. and so that's really the place where you can fertilize some of these ideas so your suggestion is uh, well appreciated all right thank you <laughs>